to now in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So there was a sort of little jokey meme that was going around online uh, recently that, that hit a little close to me, little related a little too strongly. And it was uh, just a look of great anticipation. But it was, it was, hi, a fun fact about me is I've never been relaxed, ever. <laughs> Related, a little too strongly. And the little corner of the internet that really latched onto this was my little corner of religiously traumatized former evangelicals. <laughs> because we were brought up in this mentality of constantly being told to expect the rapture, expect the return of Christ at literally any moment. And I am fully convinced to this day, and I'm sure my therapist agrees that this reality is the source of all of my like deep, troubling anxiety <laughs> well into my adulthood, that I, I am incapable of relaxing into anything at any time. And I think there is something very true, right? If you're brought up as a kid, constantly being warned to expect judgment and horror, that, that shapes you. And it shapes the way that you are brought up in faith. And I think it does breed in us, and I know this is very true for myself, a mentality of anxiety and fear that has in many ways and many times throughout my life made me smaller, less loving, less generous, less compassionate, less able to live fully into the transformative hope and indeed the good news of the gospel. And our gospel text for this morning from Luke is one of those passages, right? That is the source of that whole culture of expecting the end times that I was brought up in. That language of, you know, the thief in the night being, the, the unknown hour of the return of the thief in the night being equated to the return of Christ. And let me tell you, like, does anybody here know the movies The Thief in the Night? I know Lima does. No one else. Man, if you've ever heard of Left Behind, The Thief in the Night movies were a generation before that. So, like, the 70s and the 80s. And these were, like, horror movies they showed in Sunday school. They would, like, if you refused to take the mark of the beast, you were beheaded on an upside-down guillotine. So you, like, saw the blade. Like, and they show this to kids in Sunday school. Like, I could go on, this is, we talk about religious trauma, right? Um, but this is the idea, right? Like, and, and you can see that language here in the Gospels. And yet, what I think we miss, and what we miss in the framing, is that the, the passage begins with Jesus saying to fear not. Don't be afraid. You are coming to be invited into the wedding banquet, the master who chooses to share goodness and the hope of the kingdom with you. These passages are meant to be promises of hope, not fear of doom and judgment and horror. I think even that language, right, the urgency we hear of giving away all of your possessions, make purses for yourselves that will not wear out, I find that very powerful. And I think we can, in our modern mentality, be tempted to water that down a little bit, make that language of giving away all your possessions, giving alms, 
to try to make it more palatable to ourselves, make it sound less extreme than it really is. And I, I think that's fair when we think about this text hyper-individualistically. In 2022, in American society, it doesn't necessarily make sense for any of us practically to sell everything that we have and, and to have nothing and to live in poverty because we do not have a society structured to make that in any way possible or feasible. And yet, how often do we joke in our culture that we don't have possessions, our possessions possess us. And the vision that as is at the heart of that command, a vision of a wholly restructured community where we are not dependent on what we can possess and hoard for ourselves, but live into the freedom care and support of each other. That is the hope and the vision of God's kingdom. And I think putting a, a twist on this passage from Luke, right? Putting the twist from how it has historically so often been used to create fear to actually what it's meant to be, which is about hope and living into the transformational reality of hope in the gospel becomes even more powerful when we look at the text from Hebrews this morning. Hebrews is an incredibly theologically dense epistle in the New Testament, not in fact written by Paul, though it is often referred to as one of the Pauline epistles. Uh, but this passage about Abraham and this meditation on faith is probably one of the most well-known passages from Hebrews, that faith is the hope of that which is unseen. And this meditation offered by the author of Hebrews on the, the patriarchs of the Hebrew people who lived transformed by faith, even as the promises offered to them may not have been fulfilled in their lifetimes, right? Abraham is an incredible example of this. Abraham, who, who received the promise of a covenant with God, if you go back and look at our reading from Genesis from this morning, you can see that played out. The promise of land, the promise of a multitude of generations coming after him, and yet at the time of his death, had just the one child born of his wife in her old age. And I think there is this powerful call to the reality that we live in, in the midst of our life here, where so much that we hope for and long for at the heart of our faith is not fulfilled, is so much beyond this mess of a broken world that we find ourselves living in. And yet we are called to live transformed by hope. To live open to the ways in which the fullness of the kingdom of God does indeed break into this broken and messy world at unexpected times. And as much as growing up with that fear of the looming and, and coming at any moment idea of the return of Christ, as much as that idea created in me and for many other people, I can assure you in my experience, uh, a fear and an anxiety that made us smaller, made us less able to live into the hope and the love at the heart of the gospel. Framing these readings in the idea of hope and faith, how much more transformative is that? 
how much more does that transform the way that we are called to live and engage in this world that can seem at times so far from the fulfillment of that promise and that hope. And I was thinking about that over the last 10 days or two weeks or so when the news has been coming out about the Lambeth Conference. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with what the Lambeth Gathering is, especially those of you who are new to the Anglican or Episcopal tradition. But every 10 years, all of the bishops from around the Anglican Communion gather um, outside of Canterbury at Lambeth Palace, which is the sort of seat of the Archbishop of Canterbury, and discuss, right, right, gather. They form relationships. They discuss the state of the Anglican Communion. And it has been very fraught, this, this gathering. It's been a roller coaster to watch it all play out for any of you who may have been following <coughs> the news coming out from it. Uh, about a day before the bishops all were meant to gather, suddenly it was they were informed that there would be a vote at Lambeth to reaffirm a statement from the 90s that the p official position of the Anglican Communion is that marriage must only be between one man and one woman. And there was great consternation at this because of the way it was sort of sneakily worked into the agenda, even for the people who had been on the committee formulating this agenda. And the fact that the Anglican Communion does not vote on things. The Anglican Communion kind of doesn't actually exist. It's just a connection of relationships. The Episcopal Church, for example, is self-governing. Um, and so it just seemed framed to bring about the greatest harm, the greatest defensiveness, the greatest conflict possible for no good. And in light of that reality, there has been a lot of discussions from Anglicans and Episcopalians in the US, in Canada especially. Why are we even trying? Why are we even bothering to stay in this relationship of the Anglican Communion? What is the purpose of any of this? And yet I think about, in particular, the witness of the married gay bishops that have been a part of the Lambeth Conference. And the one who I've seen the most talking about this is Bishop Kevin Robertson from Toronto, who actually, he was the rector of a neighboring parish to mine before he was elected bishop. So I know him a bit, um, and I've seen his commentary coming out of this. And I think how easy, absent this language of faith and hope, how easy it would be for him to wash his hands of this whole process, to walk away. And yet, I think informed by what is the, the, the ultimate hope that we believe is the trajectory of our Christian faith, that is the ultimate reconciliation of us all to one another, and restored, reconciled relationship with God. I think there is that commitment that reconciliation will always be better than schism. And not in a way that is insipid, that avoids conflict, right? I think it is a very telling witness that these, the same sex spouses of bishops who were in same gender relationships were not invited to Lambeth. And yet, Bishop Kevin showed up with his husband, Mohan, who also happens to be a Muslim man, saying, this is, I am bringing my full self into this space. I'm not going to come here and, and seek unity at the cost of who I am and my marriage. But faithful, persistent hope that a better unity could be achieved in our sibling churches throughout the Anglican Communion. And to me, it is through the work of the Holy Spirit and through the faithful witness of those bishops at the Lambeth Gathering that what seemed like was going to be an utter disaster for the Communion has resulted in for the first time, the Anglican Communion recognizing and naming that there are provinces such as the Episcopal
Episcopal Church, the Anglican Church of Canada, the Anglican Church in New Zealand, for whom our faithful following of the gospel is to affirm all people in the fullness of their identity and welcome them and embrace them in the life of the church. And that is, that is wild to me. I would not have anticipated that two weeks ago. And that is the, the glimmer of hope from the Holy Spirit. And I think a powerful witness to how transformative faith and hope in what is the call at the heart of the gospel, how much more powerful that is than fear. Thanks be to God. <laughs>